everyone, thank you for coming for yet another show on the women's show. And today we are speaking on the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Today is day four, and we are talking about you know, violence among youth. And it's not that it's the only conversation happening across the world. People are celebrating you know, issues to deal with how we can eliminate gender-based violence in our societies, in our communities, and in our families. And today I have an amazing panel of women who are going to help me dissect different policy issues around how we can eliminate gender-based violence in Uganda, but then also how we can advocate for you know, better care for survivors and for finding justice for the women that have found themselves you know, caught up in the atrocities that happened to them. Someone once said that gender-based violence is a pandemic of its own. Today on my panel, I have amazing women who are doing amazing things. On my far right, I have Susanna Chen, who is a pro program coordinator mm -hmm. and a women's rights and justice to access, I think, access to justice mm -hmm. specialist, I want to call it specialist, <laughs> from you on it. Thank you for coming to my panel. Thank you very much. And for next to her, I have Marcy Mundu, my very own Kim Kardashian. <laughs> And she is a program manager at Action Age Uganda. Welcome to this panel. Thank you for having me here. A feminist, not a new face to my panels, but also a women's rights advocate, a Chirabo Marion. Welcome to my panel. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a while since I last <laughs> saw you. And next to me is Naima Issa. She is a Women's, I want to say a feminist lawyer. I, don't, I wanted to say women, but I know you said feminist lawyer feminist. categorically and a programs associate at FIDA. Welcome to my panel. I'm honored to be here. Ladies, today we have a yet touchy feeling that when we have this conversation, it's very easy to, you know, have issues that may be misplaced but also may be misunderstood, not by just women but also by men. A lot of times when we have conversations around gender-based violence, it's very quick for people to say, but even the men do face mm -hmm. gender-based violence. But our focus today is on the women. And to begin this conversation, I want us to you know, talk about what actively people are doing in terms of policy, because I know you're in spaces where these things are, are shared and, are, and conversations are happening on policies, on policies and how we can push for better policies for the protection of women and girls in our society. I'll bring you in there, Susan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would just like to go back to something that you said about uh, the 16 days of activism being a matter of human rights. Yes, matters related to violence are matters of human rights. They are couched in law. They are couched in policy at uh, the international level, at the regional level in Africa, but also in Uganda. And for Uganda in particular, we have a number of laws that directly deal with um, gender-based violence yeah. that make certain actions, offenses in law. Yeah. Um, we have a number. Um, we have an act against female genital mutilation. Yeah. We have an act that prohibits um, torture. We have an act against human trafficking. We have the penal code. We have the HIV AIDS Prevention and Control Act. Yeah. But to cap it all, we have um, the Domestic Violence Act which directly um, um, formulates offenses across the different spectrums of violence and um, mandates different uh, stakeholders to take particular interest mm. in addressing violence. So it is a matter of human rights. When we speak about violence against women, women's rights yeah. are human, human rights. rights. We need to get that right, mm. right from the start. So what are we doing in terms of policy formulation? Mm. For, um, to address violence against women. In addition to the laws that I, I, I listed, right now there's advocacy around um, reforms for sexual offenses. We have the Sexual Offenses Bill. We also have um, the Succession Amendment Act, which deals with estates of deceased persons. We also have the Marriage and Divorce Bill. And the efforts around you know, pushing for this legislation, is it's not a one-man show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or in our case, it's not a one-woman show, yeah. yes. Um, organizations have rallied around these causes. Mm -hmm. Certain organizations with the niche in um, 
particular specialties like land um, or violence or women's rights are taking lead. But what I would like to mention is that we all come together under the body of the Domestic Violence Coalition, Domestic Violence Act Coalition. Yeah. And in our different spaces, with our different influences, circles of influence, as individuals, as institutions, different actors are doing so much work to raise awareness, first of all, about the need for, um, for reform, um, to raise awareness with communities, because that acceptability mm. is what gives some of these laws um, their efficacy to raise awareness and, and convince the legislators at the national level that these laws are, are, are necessary. So it, it's happening in many ways. There is um, education, there are petitions that are written, there are uh, meetings that are held. There's so much going on and everybody is, is playing a part in it. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. And, and, mm. and you, you speak a very important thing, and that's why I want to bring Marcy in, mm. in people playing different, different stakeholders playing different roles. I remember in 2018, we had the Women's March Uganda, and it was an outcry from, you know, the femicides that were happening. And it brought the women's movement, mm -hmm. the feminists, uh, international actors were also part of that. But I want to speak to access to justice, because even when we did the march, and there was a lot of awareness, both online and offline, mm -hmm. I don't know if any of those cases were seen to, the, to their end. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it comes to access to justice, how, how are we doing as a country, especially in regard to uh, refugee women, women with disabilities, and also random everyday women? How are we getting access to justice for these particular people? And thank you. You actually remind me of the Women's March. I just saw yeah. a picture of me and, <laughs> and Stella Nyanzi at that march yesterday, and <laughs> it was a reflection of what we did yeah. then. And it was not a happy thing to do mm. at the time, but because we were coming out at a point when really we needed the state to hear about the realities of women. Yeah. And at the, at, at the time, losing all these women under very um, unreal circumstances, mm -hmm. but also mm. the children that were left helpless mm. and the fact that there was non-state responsiveness at the time. And I think the situation has not changed as much. Yeah. Uh, the access to justice infrastructure in Uganda, I must say from the policy perspective, we have robust laws and yes. policies, much as we're grappling with some core policies that are yet to be passed through parliament. Um, but I can say for the most part, we have the backing of the laws. We yeah. have also really, you know, subscribed to some of the international, you know, laws that, that, that oblige countries to apply certain standards of, of human rights protection. But in terms of the access to justice infrastructure, mm -hmm. ultimately Uganda is yet to, to get there. And I'll say this from different perspectives, because when we unpack access to justice, we must, we must ask ourselves questions around accessibility, yeah. how accessible are Is access it? to justice institutions True. for every woman in Uganda, regardless of who they are, yeah. um, how affordable is it mm -hmm. for them? Mm -hmm. Can every woman afford um, legal services? Can they afford transport to and from court? Mm -hmm. can, they afford, can they afford even to gather you know, information that yeah. they would feel is vital for them to access justice as well. And then if you look at the infrastructure itself, do we have enough personnel that man up the access to justice yeah. institutions? Do they even have the capacity? I must say that's an area that we are still uh, grappling with. Yeah. For example, our courts already are struggling with issues like case backlog. We yeah. know that. Yeah. And if you look at this case backlog, m most of the cases that are in there are actually violence-related cases. Yeah. A couple of years ago, Action Aid and FIDA did um, um, a rally around uh, getting government to establish special courts, because that's mm -hmm. a commitment they made under the Kampala Declaration. Mm -hmm. And that year, uh, the institutions demonstrated to government that this is doable. You, even if you don't put actual co uh, uh, courts court in place, mm. you can do sessions because mm. we have criminal sessions that happen yeah. every year. Mm. Why can't you dedicate some time to just listen to cases of uh, sexual and gender-based violence? Mm. And I remember that out of the cases that were handled around that time, there was a 70% reduction. Mm. That really goes to show uh, how possible this is. But as we speak now, uh, especially coming from last year and this year where this, the, the political environment has been yeah. very charged, mm. our courts um, 
grappling with prioritization. Yeah. So it's very likely that uh, a political matter will take precedence over a matter mm. related to, you know, sexual and gender-based violence mm. or a women's rights issue, so yeah. to say. So you find because of that lack of prioritization that access to justice levels for women and girls is still absolutely low. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention the fact that we had disruption of COVID-19. Yeah. I remember when the first lockdown was pronounced at that time, they, they, they cut out all the um, telephone lines, that, yeah. the, the, the toll-free lines, yeah. because they were being used for COVID response. COVID response. And at the point, uh, the state had not comprehensively put in place a framework for response to mm. gender-based mm. violence in the wake of that lockdown. Yeah. And uh, there were so many cases of incest, so many mm. cases of domestic True. violence. Mm. There were so many different, you know, gender-related cases yeah. in our communities. And of course, because we were dealing with these restrictions, people could not move, people could not access, you know, mm. personnel. Yeah. Um, this really took us 10 steps back from Very where we were. So ultimately, I can say that that even access to justice infrastructure itself got disrupted yeah. because institutions that are giving legal aid were closed, were closed. they were home. Yeah. So it took a lot of advocacy eventually for even civil society to be accepted into the different coalitions mm. that were working to respond to COVID-19. And then it took the extra effort of, you know, some organizations working with, yeah. you know, police and others to, to enable people respond at the time. And then we also still grapple with, with, you know, women's inclusion in how policies are drafted, especially yeah. taking into consideration key issues, acknowledging the role that the women, women play, play broadly yeah. in development broadly in, in issues of concern for the country. Mm -hmm. And that being the case, you realize that major elements of women's involvement and participation is missed out when policies are being, being you know, mm -hmm. drafted. So mm -hmm. now, if you look at, for example, the fact that um, there's heavy taxes being laid on, on internet access, yeah. um, how many women, how many girls are able to access um, the, the, the space, the yes. digital space yes. to market? Their, their, their products. Produce. How about the young girls who we know during this period of digital learning are overwhelmed with domestic care yeah. and they're, all, they're unable to access the digital the space digital because spaces. they either cannot afford or they don't they even have access. the time yes. and we don't have any strategies to, to, to help with that. So girls look idle to the families mm. and the families send them off to marriage mm. or things and like that. And then, yes, and then you cannot even get them to, to access justice. So it's, it's, it's a struggle. And I'll just end with also a huge gap that I see with the legal aid policy, mm -hmm. especially. We know that when I spoke about the issue of affordability, it's very core in access to justice. Yeah. And government is supposed to demonstrate commitment by ensuring that we have a legal aid policy. Mm -hmm. All the institutions you see doing legal aid are doing it based on donor funding. Mm -hmm. And with the dynamics of donor funding now, the resource envelope is, is, is shrinking. Mm -hmm. And that being the case, we very few women can then you know get these services yeah. uh, to enable them access justice and that being the case i think it's one of the things that i see that the state must demonstrate commitment in to ensure that there's a framework through which women can access justice without without the hurdles we see now thank you thank you very much and i want to bring marion there because you raise grave I, i'm somber because of the issues that are raised this is a very somber conversation to have but Masi said something about online, you know, spaces and how not only just accessibility, but also the ability for people to be there and be safe. And I want to bring you in that conversation, particularly because I know there are a lot of people that are facing, and just women and little girls that are in these spaces, and they are, you know, grappling with issues of, of harassment online, both cyber and, you know, they will they'll send you illicit nudes and they, like it violates you in every other way and with the shifting of schooling online and i'm not speaking about that the, the few that are, are accessing it but also the fact that there is inaccessible you know challenges for people that are in the rural areas who have now resorted to child labor or are child brides how can we you know leverage online spaces not only to just campaign for these 16 days but also to you know open up you know a bigger space for these campaigns to happen to help us get access and access to justice for the girls and the women. I'll give an example of the Me Too, the mm -hmm. Me Too campaign. Yeah, 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 yeah. It took down power. Yeah, yeah. That's but true. it had to also have the element of online for it to make yeah, sense. Yeah. So how can we leverage those spaces 
to be able to get justice for you know survivors and also for people that are that, that are within these systems and they don't know what to do in the moment yeah um thank you for that yes the online space has proven to be a very powerful space um right from me to movement black lives matter mm -hmm. the arab spring we have seen how uh, young people especially young people i would say have leveraged the online space to actually um make real effective change uh, you you live and see even in nigeria itself how um they have used it yeah. to to really um mobilize people and and take them out there to the streets so it's a very effective tool um However, it's an effective tool that also comes with its own challenges, yes. I would say. That the first challenge being that um, uh, for the context of Africa and also Uganda, the, uh, the fact that the affordability, yes, it is true. Few, um, if we're looking at the comparisons, and perhaps I would not have exact statistics, yeah. but even when you're looking at Uganda itself, how many people are online? I think a recent study showed about was it 5 million people yeah. i can be corrected yeah. 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 5 million people out of a population of of 45. 45 perhaps it's no wonder that even when you start campaigns online there's a way that they die they down shrink. At, at least for the context of uganda mm. that we we see so many noises online uh, you know stop this campaigns are run online mm. but it's very rare for them to take off and actually mobilize people yeah. maybe because majority of them are not actually online it becomes quite tricky with things like uh, the 12% tax now that is on data mm -hmm. it becomes tricky also with the constant um, monitoring and and suffocation of that space that mm -hmm. up to now we still have a, a shutdown on facebook that you have to use vpn to yeah. access mm -hmm. facebook mm -hmm. and that is where the majority are there are more people on facebook than even on twitter yeah so you can really see that that knowing the power of of the online space the government has really tried to curtail and see how much how much can we control mm -hmm. this space and it's not only in Uganda but across the that. world and because they are curtailing that space um they have not really concentrated on how to make that space safe you see you're trying to get people off the space so you're so not you're not, you're not really you concentrating on people to making yeah. it safe mm -hmm. So in other words, then you will see them coming up with laws that are not really helping, like the, the restrictions that they have put, you know, the anti-pornography mm. bill, mm. cyber harassment mm. act. We all know how it has been used yeah. to actually suffocate voices, but mm. also to increase, I would say, the persecution of women who mm. are actually affected by this problem. Yeah. I think we have seen how, for example, with the issue of nudes, the, the spreading of yeah. nudes, revenge yeah. porn, and we have seen when in most cases the law is actually used against, against the, the victim, victim. Mm -hmm. than the what than, than the, the perpetrator, perpetrator. Yeah. so we, we find ourselves in a tricky situation that even the laws that are made are not necessary to even protect exactly victims of harassment mm -hmm. or cyber, yeah cyber harassment mm -hmm. or sexual harassment online that it is upon the individuals that have to be so aware mm -hmm. uh, about how to use this space uh that they have to block you know uh let me make sure that i block this person from my space mm -hmm. or let me uh censor myself online so that i do not get all this backlash um let me do certain things it's it's about you the individual now mm -hmm. to protect yourself compared to now the what the state. The, that state or mm -hmm. the laws in place mm -hmm. because i think we have also seen with the issues of stella nyanzi yeah. and and how that was used so it has not the online space even with its incredible power needs a fairly let me say liberal and democratic a society for it to also equally thrive because even when you see when you look and you do a case study of the the campaigns that have opened you also have to look at the countries and the nature of their mm -hmm. democracy. Okay, democracy yeah so uh one actually leads to the other so the, the, the there has to be good will for for it to thrive However, it's not to say that it cannot still be used as an as an effective tool, tool of, of 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 change mm. or an effective tool of mobilization. Mm. I think um, 
especially for us, for those who can access it, it can be one of the ways that we can actually rally. And we have used it before. Yeah. We can actually rally people. We did use it for the Women's March. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it was effective. It, it had was the numbers. very effective. It was the numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So perhaps what we can do as maybe civil society and as activists is how do we uh, create awareness on how people can protect themselves mm. uh, individually, even without depending on the state. Mm. There are certain tools that they use. There are certain platforms that we can use. Um, for example, if it's the fear of hacking, I've had people using platforms like Telegram, mm. especially to protect uh, human rights defenders mm. when when the attacks during the elections came. came. You know, if we have a harasser, how can we? If the laws may be ineffective to help him, mm. how do you protect yourself? How do you block that person? Mm. How do you make sure that you report them to mm. the platforms, owners mm. or the platforms? I know that Twitter has a mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. You know, they report and yeah. then they, they can account. actually even block your account. Mm -hmm. So we could use these micro ways to protect ourselves online and not necessarily leave the space to to whom it may concern, mm -hmm. but make sure that it's 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 safe for us as individuals while we also advocate for the laws to be reformed to actually protect uh, the um, victims. Yeah. yeah. Let me bring you in, Naima, there, because then we speak... Partly, the problem is also the media. Mm -hmm. I remember Justice for Samantha got media play, mm. but then also sanitized the perpetrator. Mm. And the media has been called out because it holds a lot of power. Mm. We're imagining yeah. that we could yeah. leverage it to you know, eliminate and fight against SGBV. But for very many times, we've found ourselves at a place where <sighs> the media is sanitizing yeah. the offenders. Mm -hmm. And as has actually, you know, made it hard for even victims to th either to thrive or even to, to be able to be empowered to deal with the issues that they're grappling with, mm -hmm. especially sexual offenders. Mm -hmm. And I think the Justice for Samantha campaign reminded me of the fact that the person that holds power has the ability to make your case irrelevant yeah. or relevant yeah. to society yeah. at that yeah. point. Yeah. How can we, you know, use a media space? How do we empower the media to know better on how to report our, around issues on sexual harassment? And I think even not just sexual harassment, the issues of women as a collective. Because I remember, I don't know her name, I forget her name, the MP who, who, who told the court, oh, I, have an, I have an offender, he's a 20-year-old yeah, man, yeah. and the media was reporting, there is a boy. They yeah. are taking, I think she's called Susan. Yeah. There's a boy they are taking to, yeah. to court, to court mm. for, to, vibing. For, for, you know, for vibing <laughs> and, and liking an MP. Yeah. It's already a wrong narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And then earlier this year, there was a, a little girl who, who had given birth twice. She was yeah. 16. Yeah. And the media was reporting her woman. Woman yeah. gives birth twice in a pandemic. Read under below the headline, it's like 16 a 16-year-old. Yeah. She's a minor. Mm. How do we, you know, leverage that media power to report better around women issues? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the first thing I think I should bring into light is the fact that uh, Uganda is a patriarchal country. Mm. And with patriarchy comes the elevation of the goodness of the man and always the criminalization and victimization a of a woman. Mm. So it, the, it speaks to the fact that if a 25-year-old man committed an offense, he'll be referred to as a boy, and a 16-year-old girl will be referred to as a woman. It's because the society and the community has been um, set to, to believe that anything that happens to a man, it's be, uh, sorry, to a woman, it's because of her. She is to blame, yeah. but not the perpetrators to be yeah. blamed. It explains why, uh, if you're raped, the questions that will be asked will be like, where were you at that time? What the were ideal, you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing yeah. outside at that time? And what were you wearing? Mm. Forgetting that even if you're wearing an abaya, a long dress that Muslims wear, you'll, you'll still, still be yeah. a victim of yes. rape. You'll be raped. Forgetting that uh, even if you are a nun and you will, you'll really dress decently, you'll still yeah. be harassed as you're walking on the streets. Mm. A man will hold your hand, they'll touch your breast, mm. they'll touch you in any way they feel, feel like they Because mm. they feel they are, they are um, mandated. It is their right to do that. And you as a woman, it's up to you to be chased. Mm. So... Um, this has also rubbed off to the what to the media. Uh, you find that most of the reporters. Uh, I remember there is a uh, there is a. I think there is a there is a press conference I attended to, and uh, this woman was speaking about how the child died at the hands of a missionary mm. who was claiming to be a doctor. Mm, I remember and that. And a female, 
journalist asked her, then what did you do? Why didn't you do research to find out that wow. this person is really a doctor? Wow. I was like, wow. really? This is a woman asking. So you as a woman should feel the pain that a fellow woman is going through, losing yeah. a child. And this is a vulnerable woman, woman who's not educated at all. Uh, she's not been to school. She's in a remote area. And a Samaritan comes to say, you know what, we I'll have a medical you. center and we're helping yeah. you. Yeah. So as, as the media personnel, they need to be um, intentional and really, really, really critical on the way they're reporting. Um, it, it also explains the fact that you find a child who's been defiled uh, being presented before a camera. Mm. and asking her exactly. questions she's not being protected mm. yeah so uh, exactly. how do we protect the victims how do we ensure that the perpetrators don't get the power over, over the, victim? the victim yeah and it also goes to the police actually it's a whole system it's a whole system the parent will ask you why were you around the mom when mm -hmm. you're being raped instead of protecting the child you're now beating the child why did you expose mm. yourself mm -hmm. to danger it is not right as a community we need to do better and also the police where we go and report these cases. I remember there's a scenario of a, a person I know who was, you know, slapped by a teacher. And so when she decided to go to the police station to report, the police asked, do you think you're suspicious not to be slapped? So you imagine a police officer. Wow. <laughs> that's double victimization. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to run to go and get help, help. But now you're questioning my reasons for coming to get help. Mm -hmm. That is not right. And we see this happening to women. If a man went and reported a case, I don't think they'll be subject to such questions yeah. like a woman does. Yeah. And it still goes on. The media will report it, um, you know, making the victim or the person who is in wrong look like they, it was, their, it was, your, it fault. was your fault. Yeah. And then if you go to, to, uh, to courts of law with, with our court system of, you know, litigation mm. and uh, you proving that your client is innocent, so you want to victimize the, the victim at the same time during yeah. the cross uh, examination and yeah. ask her where were you at this time just to discredit you know the evidence the that evidence. the person is producing yeah. so i think it's not right morally yeah. we should do better and it goes to the media because the media has power over what they report and what the people believe mm -hmm. and if they don't change and focus more on what how can we focus on the victims you know and try to ensure that they get justice yeah. by us uh, producing news or information that is relevant to the case mm -hmm. other than watering down what the case is all about, all about and giving power to the perpetrators that is not right i think we need to do better and uh, the sensitization comes from also probably the journalists don't know like that what they're doing is wrong yeah. Yeah. and uh, as civil societies and individuals we need to educate them and yeah. keep uh, bringing this, these issues you know before them for them to realize that you know what maybe what i'm doing i think is getting news mm. but at the end of it all where is my humanity yeah. where is my mm -hmm. uh, social my responsibility as mm -hmm. a person for reporting if this was my child or my sister would i still you know report, report it the way i way. am mm. so it shouldn't be about um, money and getting you know that the, the front page of the newspaper yeah. mm. it should be about humidity your humanity as yeah. a person and uh, getting the right information there I think that's that's what the media needs that's to do. That's very important. When you're sharing, one thing kept coming back to me: the idea of the ideal victim. Yeah. And there was a conversation we had with a friend of mine, and she was like, "There was this lady that was at the the by, no, that golf course area. She was returning home from from you know selling her bananas. So she had her thing. But a Buddha comes, throws her in the bush under there near at the golf course, rapes her, gets on his border border, and runs off." And so she goes to report that particular incident and the police officer asks her, but what were you doing yeah. at the golf course? Mm. So this narrative of the ideal victim of, mm. I mean, you are, you, are, you are a banana vendor, what would you be doing by the mm. golf course? Or you're a lame person, did they also rape you? Do they even rape you know, mm. people with disabilities? Yeah. That narrative of the ideal victim, yeah. I know for a fact that it has hindered people from getting justice. Yeah. And so constantly we need to re-examine re ourselves on, you know, what narrative have we given people about, you know, who is more likely to be raped as if there is an agenda or a type of person mm, that, that should be. be. Yeah. Let, me, let me go into the issues of employment and or, or lack of it mm. for women. Mm. I want you to help me there. The study says 47 women I expected it to be for, to fall back into poverty, extreme poverty, mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that we have unpaid care work, a lot of people find it so... And, and I've heard people say, like, you really want to be paid for the work you do. But I, I went to work, did my work, and still came home, and I am working, and you're sitting and you're chilling. So the fact that there is also unpaid care work, 
and how that you know increases the urgencies of women and how they continually are caught in this economic fallout. But then also, I know Akina Mama of Africa did some work around prickly roses. There is a documentary they have called Prickly Roses. Mm. And so, uh, you know, giving and putting a spotlight on women workers that work in flowers mm. and the money they get. But also the the kind of things that they're exposed to, there is lack of labor rights for them. So how do we, you know, improve the agencies of women to be able to, you know, to be empowered with money, with finances, but then also with a livelihood that can, you know, get them out of these places that they can easily be victimized in or harassed in. Um, I was very glad when you asked about the role of the media, because on Friday, yeah. there was, um, I think it was on the Daily Monitor, the headline that said, lawyers ask, yeah. is it government or husbands to pay wives? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was... It was basically a conversation about unpaid care work, yeah. but that is the, the, narrative, the narrative that, that, that you are speaking about, mm -hmm. how they shape, narrative. you know, that sensationalism, it is irresponsible. Yeah. And I think just to answer the question you asked, one of the things that the media needs to do is to go back to the ethics yeah. of, 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 um, of journalism. Yeah. The ethics of it is what mm. is going to guide mm -hmm. how they report on these stories. Um, the question of unpaid care and domestic work, yes. During the pandemic, unpaid care became visible. It is something that we've been working mm -hmm. upon. Action Aid has done a lot of work yes. on it. UONET is doing a lot of work around that area. So it is a concept that remains alien to many of us. Mm -hmm. Also because of what you said, you want to be paid. That is how it is perceived. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a question of the framing. Mm -hmm. um, we are not yet at the point where we appreciate that home care work is, is work. work. It takes time, it mm -hmm. takes resources, it takes energy. And if you went and calculated the, uh, the time spent and gave it a monetary value, you can actually find out how much time that person, how much that caregiver would have earned if he or she were paid. Yeah. Mm. If he or she sure. were paid. Now, uh, in the last two years, because of the pandemic, the, the demands of unpaid care work uh, uh, skyrocketed, especially for women and girls, yeah. because um, families, I mean, households were full. Yes. Children were at home with their parents because they were not in school. School offers a safe space for children, mm -hmm. but also at school, there is a, a huge modicum of care. Mm -hmm. There's someone who's going to make sure your child has bathed, your child is fed, exactly. you know. So homes were full of, of um, people that needed care. And because of uh, our socialization, most of this care fell on mm. women and girls yeah. with little support, with little support in terms of extra hands. Yeah. And time is not elastic. We exactly. only have 24 hours. Mm. Yes. But also, the other thing that we saw is that the unpaid care also became, for women it also became, their ability to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. It was no longer just, have you washed, have you cooked, yeah. have you cleaned? Mm -hmm. No. Is there food? Is there food? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I remember the images of, of women being beaten on the streets of Kampala. I think that was in March last year. Mm -hmm. And then there were women who were arrested in Lira. Yeah. They were hawking fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Even the lady that was killed. Yes. Uh, delivering food. Yes, delivering mm -hmm. food. Yes, now that is all because of the demands of unpaid care, yeah, work definitely. at home. Yeah. So women have had that added um, demand on their energy, on their time, on their resources. And for some reason, I will not understand, there is a, an extent to which men take provision of home care, um, the basics of home care to be a woman's role. Mm. I do not understand that completely. Yeah. So you find this woman has to make sure that the family is fed, washed, and clean, yeah. but also that the little makeshift shaft, sh uh, shack they're living in, they are still paying yeah. that little ground yeah. rent for it. Yeah. So the demands for women went up. Now that is possibly your average woman, yeah. but for women who are in in, in, in paid um, employment, many of them could not go back to work. True. Yes, many, many women have not Going resumed back. work because, um, one, the economy has suffered so much mm -hmm. that employers have been unable to take back all their, all their staff. Right. And unfortunately, normally the first 
you know, the first victims. Mm. The axe mm. falls on women. True. Definitely. Because of your maternity roles, mm -hmm. because of your unpaid care roles. Also because of the... I mean, sometimes someone will just say, but you've been working at all. Why don't you stay? Why don't you stay? Yes. True. Why don't you stay? So at this point, what we really need to be taking advantage of this situation is to raise awareness and mm -hmm. amplify this whole discussion around unpaid care work. Yeah. It is uncomfortable because it, it questions our culture, it mm. questions um, our religious norms, mm -hmm. it, it, it shakes True. this patriarchy many base. Foundations. Yes, True. it shakes very many mm. foundations. Yeah, but we need to have this conversation. Exactly. And I was glad when I saw that headline in the paper. I was yeah. like, yes, this is what we've been working for. Okay. Let's get it out there. Let's have these uncomfortable conversations. Let them become normal. Definitely. And then we can move on mm. to what needs to be done. Mm. It's not about pay. In some jurisdictions, they're already it's paying. Kenya, yes, they're they are paying. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are not yet at that point, yeah. but there's much more that we can do. That we can do yeah. and push for. Mm. But I want to bring you in on, mm. on issues to do with children and education. I think I was more aware of the issues that were happening to girls mm. in these two years of the pandemic because they were very heightened and very, you know, they were before us. You walk on the village, there is little, this little 13-year-old or 12-year-old that is pregnant. And it's not that it happens outside their home, but it's you talk to these little children and it's an uncle, it's yeah. a dad, it's a relative. But far from being also pregnant is that we had child brides. Mm. Yeah. I think one headline last year was that there were girls being taken into marriage because they couldn't afford sanitary wear. Mm. And I'm imagining this should be a basic. So help me reimagine the image of education for such a child. Yeah. But then also the reality that this child most probably didn't even get the justice that they needed. Mm -hmm. They may have gotten redressed in community. Mm -hmm. But I think in, in some of the spaces that we share, we've, we've actually fundraised for young girls like yeah. that. Yeah. But how do we you know, reimagine life for such a child? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that the that, that image for me is, is very blurry. It's not any different from um, the conversation you just had before yeah. this one around unpaid care work yeah. as well. There's a very close correlation. True. And because many girls are also raised to just be good wives. And yeah. so exactly. <laughs> because of that, um, they're already seen as, as wife material mm -hmm. even when they're young. And the realities of COVID-19 were that um, many people were using that as a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. especially for families in rural areas yeah. where you know, coping became very complex. Uh, taking care of children at home for such a long period of time mm. is extremely difficult. And the women who have been fending are no longer going out to look exactly. for money. Mm. And so that means even the poverty index in those areas Increase. dropped significant, mm -hmm. increased significantly. And at the same time, in the family, that the, the kind of care required for household now rested more on women yeah. and, and, mm. and, and girls. I just want to say one thing about that before I speak about exactly. girls. Mm. That one of the core issues for me is that COVID exposed was mm. the, the importance of the service sector. Yeah. Yeah. You know, nursing, um, working in the hotels, food. washing yeah. food and all of this. There was a reality that that is what the world, it's the most precious most resource important. for the world. Mm. And yet it's the most neglected in our context. And it's mm. because, mm. because, yes, it's the most neglected in, a, in mm -hmm. our context. Mm. You look at how maids how much maids are paid. Yeah, yeah. You look at how much, we don't even have bedside nurses mm -hmm. here. If yeah. we do, we have very few. And these are maybe inclined to companies. But mm -hmm. generally, women have to take care of sick people. Yeah. Um, women have to, you know, work in the service sector. But it's the least paid. Yeah. Now, for a state that is very serious about its development, for a state that is very serious about wanting to move to middle income status yeah. or whatever they aspire to be, you have to invest and commercialize the service That's sector. Service sector. Exactly. You have to, because yeah. that way you will be increasing the economic power of women, of women. and ultimately that translates into very good indicators for, for, for you in terms of the economic growth, because they are yeah. the majority of your population. Yeah. If they're impoverished, your population can never move forward. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many men are in Spaces. Exactly. Trust me, if women remain poor, the country remains poor. Exactly. So for me, the mere fact that we're not even speaking about, you know, 
Mm. Commercializing the service sector for me is, is, is a red flag. Too. Yeah, we do not even have the basic, like the minimum wage. Yeah. So how do you then expect? And is it, it is a basic. It is a it basic. Is a basic. Yes. Like it let's start basic. from there yeah. because then you will know that you're resourcing women, and yeah. ultimately the results are going to contribute to where we are at in terms yeah. of our our index. But beyond that, just for girls um, in those settings, yeah. already the patriarchy we spoke about earlier shapes them into what community wants them to be. Yeah. But beyond that, the fact that we lack a proper strategy of incorporating these realities into the education, um, into how policies around education are structured, mm. there's been a really huge digital divide yeah. um, mm. with yeah. this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. You can really see True. that I can't speak about young people in rural areas the same way I speak about young people in urban exactly. areas. In terms yeah. of accessibility of education materials, mm -hmm. in terms of even the time to invest in mm. that, when they have to go to the garden, they have to take care of young children, they have to do this, they have to do that, they cannot even sit and attend a and lesson. And for them, that is survival. It Precisely. is survival. Exactly. <laughs> Precisely. So ultimately, even when schools are reopened, the kind of considerations given to the realities of these inequalities and mm. iniquities mm. is very key. And for me, that is the conversation I wanted to hear. Unfortunately, Parliament and Ministry of Education did not get to have that meeting about reopening of schools, but I was very eager to mm. hear about what eager. strategies are in place, mm. especially gender mainstreaming strategies, yeah. to ensure that our education system more than ever recognizes the inequalities, recognizes mm. the gender dimensions yeah. to our system. How do we get mm. these girls back into a mindset into a of mindset. education mm. after two years of completely getting off of that? And I think also, how do we reimagine the kind of education they are going to get? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. how practical is it, mm -hmm. especially? Uh, and this really, for me, goes to the question of curriculums as yeah. well. Yeah. How relevant is our curriculum? Yeah. <laughs> now COVID yeah. has really just woken up. Just to, Sh no, Sh even as like a lawyer, this. you know that very <laughs> soon, yeah. as a lawyer, you may not have employment because yeah. people will have yeah. opportunities to access legal services online. online. Mm. That is where the world is moving to. Mm. But with those realities, how are they reflected in how our education system yeah. is, is shaped? Because for a fact, I know many countries around the world invest in the service sector. Mm -hmm. So even as you go through school, these are natural things that women do. So you find that women will go for nursing courses, yeah. women yeah. will go for certain courses mm. that align with, with the yeah. service yeah. provision. Yeah. Because yeah. they know, even if I go for one hour here, one hour there, one hour I there, can, I would I have made my money. money. Yeah. So the work is not demonized. It's mm -hmm. not looked at a certain way. So instead of having a girl go through this curriculum and then still just drop out because they cannot perform, and then go back and do the very same things we're demonizing, which are very exactly. expensive in certain places, we would, we would take care of so many problems, mm. including the traffic in question. Yeah. Because many of these girls go to those countries to do to service. Yeah. service. It is the service sector. Service. They're True. not going there to work as lawyers mm -hmm. or teachers mm -hmm. or anything. They're going to do service. So if we decentralize that, and yeah. if we bring that conversation from a development perspective, I believe the state should pay attention and it should actually be of more interest to them, to them. so that they invest in it and we will know that the returns are for the country. And Definitely. we are really a society that consumes services. Yes, yes we, we really are. are. Yes, we do. are. I'm imagining on a, on, there is no household in Uganda that most probably doesn't have a maid. Maybe Definitely. the children are older and they can do the work themselves. Yeah. Which should be paid work as yeah. well. Sure. sure. Yes. Yeah. Chair, I want to bring you in there, but to help us as we, cause, cause as we wind down and to bring this conversation to a place where we can now create a path to what we are going to do mm -hmm. better. But most importantly, because it's going to begin with us. But who do we need to create as allies on this journey to help us, one, advocate better, but then also, you know, know where power is held so that mm -hmm. we can, you know, do better to eliminate gender-based violence and every other thing around it. Um, allies in in terms of what um, in terms of the conversation we were having with the media education mm -hmm. system and domestic yeah. and yeah. domestic work I would say I would say for me personally through my organizing and uh, through what I've, I've been doing I think to me the first ally is young people even before I go to government, even mm. before I go elsewhere. Mm. I don't know if others agree with me, but I feel like 
the older generations have their own thinking of mm. what gender is, yeah. Yeah. what yeah. a yeah. woman is. Mm. It's very highly unlikely that you're going to change their mind yeah. Yeah. right mm. now. They are occupying these spaces and they will, they will continue to, to, um, to perpetrate things that they have grown up with yeah, for these conservative ag- mm. ideas that they have been with. So in that, in that sense, I'm not saying that you, you neglect them completely, but yeah. then you have I to hear focus. You. I do hear you because yeah. it speaks to giving, especially feminist leadership, yeah. young women, yeah. mm-hmm. the platform to be able to uh-huh. now rewrite yeah. the narrative yeah, yeah, yeah. around yeah. how we are organizing. So, so for me, I've always put my emphasis on my generation that... Okay, in my space, Gen Z, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, very complicated generation, Gen Z. very open-minded and very liberal. True, you mm-hmm. see, mm-hmm. that it's easy for you to convince them that you see, um, domestic work should be paid work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's much easier because they are more. The environment that they are in mm-hmm. allows mm-hmm. them to think outside yeah. Yeah. of the box, and mm-hmm. things have changed around them. Mm-hmm. They're witnessing things like Me Too movement, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm women in leadership. So their mind is, they are easy to accept certain notions, you know. They are sitting in, in, in the same space, both men and women receiving an education, you know. They, they have grown up in a society that people keep on advocating for women's rights. Mm. So it's much, much easier for you to go down and mm-hmm. preach to them the gospel of what? Of feminism compared to your grandma oh, sure. or your mom yes, in sure. the household who keep on telling you, but there are some things, you are a woman, there are some things yeah. that do not yeah. change about yeah. you. Mm-hmm. So for me, that would be the first allies. How do we also get rid of these, uh, I would call them gender studies, uh, that, that how do we change the curriculum to get rid of some of these gender stereotypes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What a role of a mother is and role of a father Ooh, is. Who is the head of the family? Who is the head of the family? Who is the head of the family? Who is a man? Yes, those are, could a uh-huh. could be a woman. It could be a child. It could be even a child. Different. <laughs> so, so for me, those yes. are the soft spots I would first target even mm-hmm. before I go through, um, I go to, let me say, government and all mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. I would first target those that mm-hmm. I, I can easily indoctrinate so when I, I do that, then I know that when, let me say, I've focused on these graduates, once they are churned out and go into the judiciary, mm. or they go into the media, mm. or, or they go into whatever places they go into, yeah. they will see things from a gender lens. Yeah. yeah. You mm. get. And then I would really advocate for, yes, uh, gender studies to be incorporated into our school curriculum mm-hmm. so that I train a generation of elites, elites who see everything through a feminist lens and yeah. a gender perspective. The other thing I would do, uh, particularly for the media, it, it requires a lot of resources and all that, mm-hmm. but I think civic space is an example mm-hmm. that you have been locked away from, let me say, attending um, um, being on talk shows yeah. on the media, being mm. everywhere that they do not want you on certain panels on different media houses. Mm. So you go and you correct, create your own platform mm. that mm. sells narrative. your narrative of yeah. what you want people to hear. I think as activists and as women's rights activists, you can start up a magazine that mm. talks about your issues, yeah. a newspaper, depending mm. on what your resources are. You go on and start an online newspaper talking about... Have a about, women's show. Ah, mm. yes, have a women's show. <laughs> sure. Sell your narrative because there might be little you can change in their patriarchal setup yeah. because we've been talking about the media for years. Yeah. Mm. Sure. So how do you create a counter-narrative? Because, mm-hmm. you know, there's a saying that and, and until the lion learns to tell his story, it will always the hunter, be the hunter. The hunter. Exactly. Yeah. The stories will always glorify the hunter. So... Why is it that as feminists we do not have our own media? Our own media. Mm-hmm. You know, why aren't we telling people about our what? Story. Yeah, our own mm-hmm. stories. So mm-hmm. can we look at that? Can mm-hmm. we look at 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 making sure that people get to know that you see this is sex education is not actually what yeah. you believe that it's about. You know, homosexuality mm-hmm. and what? But although that is also an important conversation to have. 
but it's so much more contraceptives yeah. is this and this yeah. you know they are not mm. actually they are actually very safe mm. why don't we have our own um media talking about that, that. because there's very little you're going to change about these mm. people right now so for me going into my organizing uh, as much as the advocacy for the policies to be changed i understand that the policies even if you change them without that infrastructure the implementation yeah. it's going to be very hard mm. so for me in my own small capacity i look at what are the low hanging fruits yeah that we can start with yes that i can start with mm. instead of pulling ropes with government all yeah. the time what are the mm. low hanging fruits how mm. do i change in my small where even government will look at me and ignore me and think that what i'm doing is very and changes are cumulative yes mm-hmm. so yeah. as yeah, i go are. on creating the critical mass that i need then eventually mm. i can actually also push these bigger bodies the yeah. judiciary and what to make sure that my voice is heard because i have built grassroots um, yeah. wise yeah mm-hmm. and up to me that's what i would think thank you um faith i'll just like to jump mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. um just to add to what um, marion has said one of the things we need to do in creating our allies mm-hmm. in understanding where the power yeah. is mm-hmm. is to understand why people um make the decisions they do, they do. how they think the way they mm-hmm. do for example um, members of parliament mm-hmm why they support the bills that they, they do, do or why they yeah. vote for yeah. the ones that they do yeah. in 20, 2019 um Uonet did a, a study with um, an institute called Busara Institute of Behavioral Economics oh. that basically studied how members of parliament make decisions on mm. these gender related mm. bills yeah. because we are at a stalemate. Mm-hmm. We've hit a brick wall. True. We are working so hard, but we do not feel the results. The, the results, results, like yeah. anything true, is changing. True, true. And the findings were actually very, interesting. very interesting. Mm-hmm. For example, on issues related to marriage and succession, mm-hmm. Muslim, the Muslim community was more open to a number of issues re- that we find in the marriage and divorce bill mm-hmm. than Christians were. Mm-hmm. But again, that comes back. That, that goes back to our religious mm-hmm. beliefs. Mm-hmm. True. One powerhouse was the cultural and religious institutions. Mm. MPs are influenced by their yeah, cultural by their and religious way. institutions. Mm-hmm. And yet in these conversations that we are having, they are normally on the sidelines. Mm. We consider them, um, what are they, as detractors. Mm. How are we bringing them in? Mm. The other powerhouse was, and I think for this is really for political mileage, mm. it was the president, it was the speaker, and then... Um, the chief whip. Mm. Very so how in our advocacy are we involving those, those three people. offices? Yeah. How many times, for example, have we gone to meet the president the to tell whip. him or the chief or the whip? Chief whip. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we are always running after committees. Yeah. But remember, the they pres- speak to a higher power. Yeah. The Definitely. president once you know? called us when I was working at FIDA for a mm. um, meeting. On the, that was when the heated debate around the marriage and the yeah. bill was mm. happening. And somehow we got ready and got everything together. He wanted to really listen to mm. the women's voice. Mm. Just before we went, a caucus happened. And yes, that's it. It, it was yes. shelved. Yes. No, but I believe that if that didn't happen, yeah. yes. perhaps the change we wanted Would was really yeah. going to come going because to the come first in. lady and other people around him were very progressive about listening to just what mm. we had yeah. to do. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think And I think that is really, happening. really important because mm. you just need to know who are the power holders and how do we dismantle the power they have mm. to influence yeah. our agenda as like a women's organization or mm. a women's movement. Yeah. Failure yeah. to do that. The more we meet committees, that's why it's like you have meetings every year, but nothing is happening. Yeah. The marriage and divorce bill has sat on the table for how yeah. many years? Mm-hmm. True. Yeah. Very. And so <laughs> just know which people to, 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 you know, to involve in your mm. conversation, which people to engage, and then are the things that we want would be done. I, I yeah. agree. I agree. Yeah. And two yeah. things in that. One is, for example, uh, when we're speaking about the media being an ally and how they yeah. report. For example, when they're reporting about defilement cases, they will say uh, 300 girls were defiled. They will not say 300 men defiled mm-hmm. girls. Yes. Mm. Like, precisely, like, stop mm. making the narratives about, about, about the survivors. Women, about the survivors. Mm. Yeah. We report the other way around and we sure. see what the difference but, is. But mm. also about but, change. I think FIDA has done... Um, uh, training with judges, yes, especially, yes. Mm. Yes. 
And I think you have seen real change in yeah, their in judgment. The they, that's yeah. true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, that's very true. So, now, I'm going to close this conversation because we're going to be here. <laughs> okay. And it's, it's, a, it's rather interesting to have this conversation constantly because it's mm. important to hear what's, what's on ground. But help me understand, because there's a narrative that is sneaking through the corridors of the boys matter too uh -huh. and sometimes uh -huh. it's women in our very own organization mm -hmm. that are you know running with it yeah. how do we have women issues stay as women issues without you know always being said that it's almost like the black the, the black the lives matter back. movement mm -hmm. and the all white, lives white, matter white. Mm -hmm. how do we constitute mm -hmm. on having our conversations without you know the detriment of pouring in every other time that boys matter too okay. but then also the fact that um, the day of the girl child will happen and then they'll sneak in boys matter too. The women's day will happen. Women's day. And then what about the men? Oh so God. how do we, you know, center the conversations around women? And that's, that's our party should center with conversations around mm. women without, you know, sneaking in under the rugs issues of men. Okay. I think uh, this stems from the fact that uh, as women ourselves also, the women that aren't feminists, women who have not been in these spaces where we've had uh, critical conversations about women have been do not understand why it is that we're pushing yeah. for the women's uh, you know, agenda and, yeah. and the women matter. For years, like I said, patriarchy has been an issue for women. Yeah. We have been sidelined. We have been told to keep quiet. We don't have space to speak in public. We still see that in the rural areas where yeah. a woman cannot sit on a chair when the husband mm -hmm. dies. So what we're doing as women organization is to empower women to be able to speak, mm -hmm. to realize that they're, they're human beings and they also have rights. Yeah. If you look at most women, they do not know that they have the same rights. Yeah. And this has been affected by, you know, fundamentalists, mm -hmm. you know, the religious fundamentalists, the, the political fundamentalists, mm -hmm. the cultural bit of it. Yeah. Well, for example, I'm a Muslim. And with, with, with Muslims, um, a woman, you cannot speak in public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though I... I dismantle that i don't mm. care i will speak in public if i have to okay. if you look at culture some cultures women can't speak where there's a you know a gathering of men yeah. so um women like we said our grandmothers our parents have grown up indoctrinated with that belief as a woman if you look at our four grand grandmothers they okay. would not eat uh, eggs they would not mm. eat chicken and then you, you ask yourself if i we are eating it now there's nothing happening we're not dying you know yeah. so um the older generation have believed that uh if I'm going to empower a woman, I should also empower a man. Mm. Forgetting that boys have been empowered for years. They've been exactly. given spaces, opportunities. Mm. And even in education system, boys yes. have been educated and girls are trained to be yeah. mothers mm -hmm. know, and wives. Mm. So if we're coming out to say that this is a conversation for women, people need to understand where this stems from. Yeah. We have been um, denied opportunities and chances for ages, for centuries. And this is the time that we're saying, you know what? Enough is enough. We are human beings. Spaces. We're taking these spaces. Mm -hmm. If we don't have seat on the table, we're coming with our stools and sitting on those tables and yeah. discussing issues that are of importance for women. Yeah. So uh, the women who are saying boys matter too, yes, boys have been empowered, but let's not take away the light for the girls yeah. and sneak in the boys to take mm -hmm. that, you know, because mm -hmm. boys will be given opportunities. You go for an interview, you'll be asked if you're married, if you have children, but a man will not be asked the same. Exactly. So we're standing to say, if you're going to ask a man, uh, me about marriage and children, do the same to the boy child. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to do that, then shut up and let us take the floor. Make mm -hmm. noise about it. I think uh, that's all we have to, 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 to tell the, the other women out there. Thank you very much. And I don't want to ever call, you know, stop conversations about women issues because one, it empowers me to go out there and do better. But then also it's a conversation that helps you see that there is work being done. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being part of this show, but also for you know running with the narrative of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. The drive continues until December 10th, and we'll meet you at the other side as we talk human rights issues. I need you to remember that women rights are human, human rights. rights. I've been your host today, Nabea Trisha Gloria, and I'm glad that you came by. Thank you. Mm -hmm.